So over this past weekend, we completed the Vajrasattva retreat where we reviewed harmful actions that we've done in the past and thought about ways to purify them from our minds. And one of the main ways of doing that is to visualize light and nectar coming from Vajrasattva into us. And that's a remedial action. And then we make a strong determination not to repeat that action again in the future. We restore our connection with sentient beings wanting to be of benefit. And then we, uh, first of all, probably want to develop a strong sense of regret. And so the way that uh, is a good way to develop regret for an action is to think about, well, what were the results? And uh, this is one of the meditations in the guided meditations on the stages of the path book that Venerable Chojin put together based on the Lamrim. And so you do a life review and you think about all the misdeeds that you've done and you think, okay, well, what were the short-term and the long-term results? So I was doing a lot of that uh, during this past retreat and it became very clear to me uh, how karma works, um, the law of cause and effect in terms of whether we experience suffering or whether we experience happiness. So I was going through my past actions and trying to think, okay, when I've done that in the past, what has been the result? So I want to share some of that with you today. So for killing, um, I was thinking the result is just being afraid of other beings. And I grew up in a city and it, it wasn't well, parts of it were high crime, but where I lived was fairly safe. But I grew up where uh, we always double locked our doors and put a chain up at night. Um, I always checked under the car <laughs> or in the back seat before I got in it to make sure there was nobody hiding there. Um, I, I took, my parents encouraged me to take karate <laughs> and they also gave me uh, tasers and mace so that I could protect myself. So, you know, this image has sort of come with me. Um, so coming to live at the Abbey where it's very um, relaxed, I was like, whoa, what's going on? And I had never questioned my attitude before. But, yeah, I think being very safety conscious all the time might be related to harming others in the past or having killed them. Uh, I also had a friend who was from West Virginia. He owned a lot of guns. And one time when I felt threatened, I was like, hey, let me borrow one of them. And he's like, sure. So that wasn't very wise. And thankfully, nothing happened. Uh, but again, it's like that tendency, yeah, this is a big threat. You know, I, I need to defend myself, that mentality. And then insects. Um, I used to not like going outside because of insects and, you know, thinking, oh, I'm going to get um, West Nile or Lyme disease. I mean, these are mostly harmless little insects, but I just had this idea that, oh, they're so irritating and they're so dangerous to me. And I think that comes about from having killed other beings in the past and seeing them as threats and enemies. So then stealing. Um, I had my car broken into uh, when I was a teenager. My stereo system was stolen. My CDs are stolen. So again, um, I had this sensitivity about theft and locking everything up, making sure it was safe. Uh, I have a special uh, aversion to people who are politicians who steal from their elected population or, you know, they're corrupt. And it seems to me that I have some kind of unresolved issues with that in the past because I get really, really angry about it, whereas other things I don't really care so much about. And then... Um, I'd say my family was generous, and I, I witnessed a lot of generosity growing up. So um, I'm not sure stealing was such a huge issue for me in the, this life. Um, but I notice a tendency that whenever something goes missing, I automatically assume somebody must have taken it, as opposed to I lost it. So then sexual misconduct. Um, I always found cheating very unexcusable. Um, just terrible in so many ways. Um, I worked on human trafficking issues and sexual trafficking is particularly abhorrent to me. I can't hardly imagine anything worse than that. And um, 
people in power who abuse others, use them as sexual objects. It seems that I've had to hear a lot about that since I ordained. And it causes me a, a lot of distress. So I'm thinking, you know, this is the result of having been involved in, in some way in the past. Maybe I covered something up. Maybe I was complicit in some way. But again, I just notice it, how much this affects my mind and my, my state of mind, my peace of mind. And that gives me a clue that there's something here I need to really purify. And I was always, well, not always, more often than not, I thought I was unlucky in love. And so I'm really happy about that right now, actually, <laughs> because I wouldn't be here if I was lucky. <laughs> But again, I, I think, like, you know, relationships not turning out the way I wanted them to turn out, I think that is related to um, sexual m misdeeds in the past, in past lives. So then with lying, um, I think one of the biggest effects of lying is feeling lonely, feeling alienated. It's because when we lie, we create this little world that only we're a part of, only we know the truth, and we're, you know, shutting other people out from that. So I, I've experienced this um, quite a bit. And we can't, feeling like I can't share my true self with others, I can't share my true feelings because I'll be rejected. And also starting to feel like I don't even know myself sometimes. Um, a lot of, you know, alienation from the self. So I think that could be a result of lying. Divisive speech, um, I was a victim of grade school betrayal and um, subject to unfair rumors and uh, slander, gossip. And I definitely attribute that to past life um, because it stuck with me. Now I have this kind of tendency to really doubt other people, hard time trusting. Um, and I realize it's my own mind that's really creating this um, world out there that's unsafe. And Venerable Children gives the example of if we walk into a room and people are talking and then they are immediately get quiet, the self-centered mind says, oh, they must be talking about me. That doesn't happen too much. But yeah, I have trust issues. So then, um, harsh speech. Uh, as a child, I was um, called some names. I mean, I think it's hard to find a child who wasn't called some names. So that wasn't such a huge thing. Um, but I was trying to think of, you know, what are some instance or it, indications that people had harsh speech in the past and I think growing up in a household that's very abusive lots of verbal abuse or someone's subject to a lot of harassment you know maybe just because of the color of their skin or their gender um, I think yeah that's a result of speaking harshly to others so for idle talk um, I always thought oh that's not so bad and my whole adolescence was hours and hours on the phone idle talk I thought it was a virtue, actually, that I could talk about nothing for so long. <laughs> but now when I go to meditate, like, my mind wants to recall, like, use useless trivia. I had a friend who was so good at Trivial Pursuit, and it's like random facts about nonsense. And I was, like, jealous of her because she knew that. So now when I sit down sometimes, I'm like, oh, what was, you know, the name of that person in the movie? And it's just so obviously pointless. So I attributed that tendency to idle talk. And also sometimes I just notice want to be distracted. So like watching the Bodhisattva cat video <laughs> multiple times. <laughs> or just, yeah, animal videos. Yeah. So yeah, it, it becomes a problem when we want to develop deeper states of concentration and have a more steady and wise mind. Um, so then with coveting, that one was really interesting um, because I have some compulsions um, that are so strong and so unusual that I think they must have come from past lives. There's really nothing in this life that could explain it. And I used to think I have an addictive personality but after studying the mind more, I think that obsession and irrationality are just natural byproducts of attachment and ignorance. So I no longer feel like such an outlier on this. Um, but yeah, just watching the compulsive nature of some of my thoughts, I'm like, wow, I can see how people become insane, how they might fall into obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, if we keep doing the same thing over and over again and the result isn't different, then, you know, you really got to 
what wonder what's going on with your mind. There's something <laughs> not adding up there. It reminds me of um, like a rat in an experiment that just keeps pushing a lever trying to get the pellet, even though the pellet is just long gone. So this is very, um, yeah, it was disturbing to me at first when I noticed it when I first started to meditate. But yeah, I think it, it's more understandable now. So malice, um, again, fear and distrust of other people. Um, I know some people are very uh, afraid of even just going outside of their home or they buy all kinds of security equipment or they track their children down like hawks. Um, that hasn't been my experience so much, but um, I do notice myself assuming that people have bad assumptions or that they're actively trying to harm me when in fact that's really not the case. And this has caused a lot of stress and unhappiness in relationships. So then last, lastly, wrong views. And despite studying Buddhism for about 17 years now, I find myself thinking wrong views all the time, like other people are responsible for my anger, or death is a hypothetical, or um, it's not fair when I'm suffering, you know, somebody's to blame there. And also I feel, often feel powerless when I experience suffering, like, oh, there's nothing I can do, so I'll just sit here and be miserable. Thankfully, I'm getting better at recognizing these wrong views, but I have met people who um, really showed me the power of, of wrong views. And um, I had an interesting experience when I was staying at a Zen monastery. Um, we went to visit a local mosque in a Sufi compound, and we talked to the people there. And they were so convinced of God. It was like, you know, there was no space for them to question or for us to really talk about it. They were so, yeah, convinced. And they were so convinced, they almost convinced me too. I'm like, oh my gosh, maybe I'm really missing out on something, you know? The way this woman spoke about her connection with God, and then the wind was blowing, and she sees, said, that, see, that's God. And I'm like, wow, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's true, but, you know, I don't think so. <laughs> so, yeah, I hope that the sharing will help you to um, identify maybe some of the reasons why you think the way that you do. And um, as always, the reason in doing this kind of investigation is to convince ourselves not to do harmful actions again in the future because results certainly will follow. And I think just as important as looking at the negative habits is also looking at the positive habits so that we can get a more balanced view of ourselves and then we can also encourage ourselves to keep doing these things in the future. And then little by little, we can become the people that we want to be and also help others to do the same. <laughs>